My lab at the University of Minnesota studies the basic mechanics of how cells crawl and divide. Even in the very first cell division, symmetry is broken, which establishes the basic body plan. I'm joined today on stage by the Black Label Movement Dance Company, who I've asked to portray the rules of symmetry breaking for you. Joining them are volunteers led by Carl Flink, BLM Artistic Director, and these volunteers have been given only nominal instruction. Immediately after fertilization in the worm known as C. elegans, symmetry is broken by an ensemble of molecules, including MEX5, shown in red. In this movie, obtained by my colleagues Eric Griffin and Geraldine Sedu, MEX5 initially starts out uniformly distributed in the cell, but within a matter of minutes is concentrated on the left side. We think this happens in the following way. Freeze! So Patrick here is one of the MEX5 molecules and he can move at either of two speeds, fast or slow. And he switches between those two speeds. Now a switch from fast to slow is random, it doesn't depend on where he is. But a switch from slow to fast depends on whether he's on the right, the middle, or the left. If he's way over here on the right, he, sw he switches to fast, which I'll call activation. He activates rapidly, so he spends very little time going slow. If he's in the middle, his activation takes some time. It's more like a 50-50. And finally, if he's over on the left side, he's not allowed to activate at all. So again, Patrick activates quickly on the right to not at all on the left. And the same rules apply to everyone else. So let's get moving again. So the MEX5 molecules in this human scale simulation are not instructed to move to the left and yet, by obeying these simple rules, they wind up spending more time on the left than on the right. And ultimately, what we seek are models that we can use to accurately describe cellular processes and then use those models to design therapeutic strategies. Now, ideally, our models are mathematical or computational. However, this type of modeling comes at a cost. It takes weeks, months, or even years to develop these models. And on top of it, it turns out the graduate students like to eat once in a while, so they need to be paid something. So it comes at a cost. Now, as a complement to mathematical modeling, I started to work with Carl Flink on human movement-based modeling to rapidly prototype and simulate our hypotheses. And so what we've been doing is simply, in many cases, brainstorming competing ideas about how a cell works, and, but then embodying those ideas through dance, through movement, to act them out. And we call this rapid prototyping body storming. Now, in most technology-driven sectors, such as aerospace and chemical processing, engineers routinely use physical and chemical principles to design, simulate, and control complex systems, which ensures a high probability of success. By contrast, for pharmaceuticals, the success rate in phase two clinical trials is around 25%, which means that the cost of failure has to be built into the price of the relatively few successes. So an example of a complex disease process that my lab seeks to control is the brain cancer glioblastoma, which eventually takes over the entire brain and gives patients immediate survival of just 15 months. Glioblastoma progression is driven largely by the migration of tumor cells out of the tumor in the lower left and out into the brain. Using engineered materials, we can recreate many aspects of the brain environment outside the body and then study cell migration in a more controlled environment. And from these experiments, we're now developing theoretical models of virtual cancer cell that we can use to simulate, theoretically, various ways to disable cancer cell migration. So you might be asking yourself, how did I get mixed up with a bunch of dancers? Well, for me, it started with an interest in catastrophe. So inside each of our cells are hundreds to thousands of microtubules, which dynamically grow and shorten. So stably growing microtubules, which, whose tips glow red in this movie, suddenly stop growing and abruptly start shortening, a process that's called catastrophe. Now, catastrophe is vital to cell division, and targeting it, for example, with the drug Taxol, is a major approach to treating cancer. Now, it turns out that my brother Tom is also interested in catastrophe, except that it, he's interested in how it's depicted in film. So through the Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Minnesota, we organized a symposium called Catastrophe. And it was through the Institute that I met Carl Flink, 
who at that point was choreographing a piece he called Wreck, which depicted the last moments of life on board a sinking ship. As I watched Rec being performed, I was struck by the athleticism and physicality of the movers. And so Carl and I thought it might be interesting to try to convey, through dance, microtubule catastrophe for a non-scientific general audience. Now, life inside of a cell is anything but graceful. Molecules are moving at hundreds of miles per hour, and, but they're in very close quarters, so they're constantly colliding with each other. And this gives rise to random movement, which we call diffusion. And that's what the MEX5 molecules were doing earlier, diffusing. Now, molecules inside the cell are bounded by a membrane, okay, and they're still moving at these terrific speeds, and so they diffuse around. And now I'm a molecule inside the cell. I can tell you it's a lot of fun. Okay. And once we're inside the cell, we can uh, start to play with the thermodynamic variables that we engineers like to play with, like temperature, so we could start to move faster. And then we could dial it back down. Then we could change the volume. We could decrease the volume. And we collide more frequently. Then we can dial it back up. So we can rapidly prototype different scenarios inside the cell. Then we can start to add things like chemical reactions. We can add a bond. So for example, Jess and I could form a bond that could persist for some amount of time, and then it might break back apart. Now we can change the rules of the bonding just slightly so that we, instead of forming front to front, we form from to tail. So we have a bond like this. And we might get a chain going. This, this is the beginning of a microtubule, and then it might fall back apart again. Now, one thing I certainly didn't expect was that the movers would start to make up their own rules. This didn't correspond to anything I thought actually happened in a cell, but they sure seem to have a lot of fun with it. So I just started to think of those as mutations. <laughs> OK. So a key question we had to address was, uh, whose model should I be choreographing? I mean, I had the textbook model, but my own model was different than the textbook. And so I kind of wrestled with whose model we should depict. The textbook depicted a slow and efficient assembly process. And my own research indicated a slow, uh, sorry, rapid and inefficient process. So if I was going to choreograph it my way, other scientists in my field might not agree with it. And then I thought to myself, well, if they really don't like it, they can go get their own dance company. <laughs> so, but this actually led us to the idea of body storming which is, you know, maybe this could advance the scientific discussion. So with prodding from Carl, I began to consider that human scale movement might be useful for researchers to engage in dialogue with other researchers and test their ideas. So um, what we did was we invited other scientists to come join us, Enrique de la Cruz, uh, Dyke Mullins, John Bohannon, and we tackled uh, controversies in our field using uh, movers as our medium. And a fundamental question we addressed was, to what extent does crowding in a molecule, uh, in a cell, affect the rate of the reaction? And the answer to this question is vital because uh, molecules that don't react uh, can get in the way of ones that want to react, and we wanted to see how this would affect the rate of the reaction. And so from our initial body storming, which we went back into the cell and started to test out different scenarios for crowding. So for example, Jess and I could form a bond, but Zach and Margaret cannot. Okay. We soon found that this was actually the crowding was going to slow down the reaction. And so with this new kind of awareness, I then went and started a rigorous computer simulation. And my student now has a good working model for crowding, where these two molecules are trying to react. And he finds that uh, in some cases, it does slow down. But actually, interestingly, in other cases, it speeds up. And this is our model, and we don't exactly know why. So we're trying to understand our own model, though, that we built trying to deconstruct it. So we're going back into the body storming arena to try to deconstruct our models to better understand how they work. So the emerging paradigm for us is one where we go back and forth between human scale simulation and computer simulation, depending on what's uh, rate limiting to us. Now, where are we headed in the future? Well, recently, we've gone back to our virtual cancer cell 
to better understand how that model works. So uh, I showed this before, but when cells are migrating, they dynamically extend and retract processes, which allows them to move in a semi-random manner. Now the, the cells move forward by acting self-assembling at the leading edge to push the membrane forward, which allows the cell to advance. But oddly, the actin filaments, as they're pushing it forward, are actually moved backwards by molecular motors. Those motors generate traction forces that pull on their environment. And you can actually see these pulling forces. And here this cell is pulling on the bead in the upper right. And then you notice that the linkage mechanically fails catastrophically, and the bead snaps back, kind of like a finger picking a guitar string. So we continue to develop mathematical models for how cells get traction. And in parallel, we manifest those models using human movers. So Carl here serves as a molecular motor. The rope is the actin filament. Patrick is an adhesion bond. And Margaret is outside the cell, representing the compliant environment that the cell exists in. Now once we have that module working, we can then link it to a second module. And now they can battle it out to see who's going to win. And if we wanted to, in our simulations, we could add a third or fourth module, and so forth. Obviously, this human-based version of the migrating cell lacks all the complete details of what's going on. But it's important to appreciate, I think, that in things like aerospace and chemical processing, the models that we use there also lack complete details. And yet, they're useful to engineers to control and design uh, airplanes and chemical plants. What would the future lab look like where scientists and dancers collide? Recently, we uh, developed a new lab in, uh, we prototyped it in an abandoned torpedo factory in northeast Minneapolis. Inside of this lab, we built a, we built a chain link cell. Okay? And we got the dancers and the scientists in there. And over a period of four weeks, we simulated diffusion, reaction, self-assembly, forces. In this case, the symmetry breaking of mediated by MEX5. So it's in this new lab that we picture scientists, artists, and engineers working together to advance both science and art. Is this science? You might ask that question. Here's how my student, Kwaku, answered that question. So is this science? Is this science? Is this science? This is beautiful science. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the art? Can science drive a new model for art? What you're about to see is an excerpt of a new dance piece entitled Hit, which came as a direct result of our collaboration.